getting pretty close here. Hi, Scott. Hey, Justin. Hello, Kelsey. Thank Hi. you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Couldn't be more excited for your talk. Great, um, me too. Yeah, it sounds like you have everything sorted, everything you need. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and I'll, I'll Scott. I assumed I was moderating and running the queue and stuff. Oh no, feel free to, okay. Jess. This is your this is your show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just to just briefly remind folks though that we do have um, Homa um, Tahiri in the research series on Wednesday. So hope you can make that. And we have a special presentation uh, by Abby York on Thursday as well. So that that's a virtual, of course, especially given the snowstorm here in Bloomington. So fingers crossed that, <laughs> that everything goes according to plan there. Um, but yeah, just wanted to flag a few of those upcoming events. Thanks, Jess. Uh, I do have a question about the oh, yeah. Abby York talk, because um, yeah, yeah. some of us were trying to one, were wondering if that is for a job in SPIA or if it's like related to the Ostrom workshop position. Um, yeah, what, what job is this for? <laughs> yeah, no, it's both. It's both, Jamie. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, there's 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 no there's no secrets here, right? So um, as as you guys know, we're advertising, um, and we've been going through the process of finding a new permanent director for the Commons program after Bill did such a great job launching it. Enza's done a tremendous job of keeping it going, but now we have this authority to, um, you know, find a permanent hire. So Abby is one of the finalists um, for that. So she'll be giving the job talk, of course, at at SPIA, which could potentially be, you know, an academic home. Um, but she will also be potentially, you know, the Commons program director. So that's why she'll also be giving a, a talk uh, for the for the WAC for the Workshop Advisory Council um, as well. So there you and we'll have several other finalists coming through in the weeks ahead too. <laughs> that's what I was wondering if this was like you know a string of um, job talks that we should be on the lookout for. Oh um, sure, yeah, and we'll look cool. at that information to you guys as it you know as as it as it's finalized. I think. I think we're mostly there <laughs> in terms of finalizing the details. They should be happening through more or less mid-February. Um, but I'll, yeah, we'll be keeping you guys up to date as that process moves forward. And there'll be a chance um, to meet uh, virtually or in person, you know, not only during these talks themselves, but, you know, with the candidates as they're coming through. So that's going to be fun. Oh, and I, I, I'll go ahead and flag this, but we'll put an announcement. I'm also going to be doing a um, kind of a state of the workshop um and it's just a, a general WAF meeting and also kind of a state of the workshop um summary so that's a great chance to kind of chat about this stuff and any other questions and just kind of let you guys know about some of the other things in the works to get your comments and reflections too uh so that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks as well so i'm sorry to monopolize jess um, <laughs> no problem. thanks um thanks for that as a good update and, and helpful to remind us all of what what's happening at the workshop um Without sort of further delay, I want to introduce today's colloquium speaker, uh, Kelsey Jack, um, who is an associate professor at the Bren School of Environmental and Sci uh, Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. We were just discussing how beautiful it is there. Um, Kelsey directs the Poverty Alleviation Group at the Environmental Markets Lab at UCSB and also co-chairs the Environment and Energy Sector at the Abdul Jalib uh, Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab at MIT. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with uh, this group as they um, their uh, founders won the won the Nobel Prize a couple of years back. Um, <clears throat> she has published widely in AER, PNAS, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organizations, World Development, etc., on a wide range of questions, largely related to allocation of labor and resources to improve both environmental and economic outcomes in developing contexts. I hope I sort of summarized your wide list of publications there, um, but they really. Uh, are really extensive um, uh, with some common, very important themes. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey, but really quickly, um, just a reminder, um, I will keep a chat, uh, a sort of a log of the chat. So if you have a question or a comment, please um, just write it in the chat, say I have a question or a comment. It's a little bit harder sometimes for me to, to keep track of whose virtual hand goes up in what order, um, but I will keep the cue and we will um, go from there. And just a reminder, um, Kelsey has agreed to hang around a little bit after her talk to continue chatting with those that are interested. So we will end at one, but we will hang around a bit longer for anybody that's interested. Um, and uh, we will leave it at that. Kelsey, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen um, and uh, begin your presentation. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Yeah, excellent. Well, thanks to everyone for being here and, 
Um, I warned Jess, this is actually the first time I've given a kind of political science style workshop. So um, I will try to keep this, uh, this very brief and just cut me off if, if you need to. But what I'm gonna try to do for the next 15 minutes or so is kind of remind you of what the, what the paper is about and then hopefully have a little bit of time to talk to you about some of the things that we're still really working on where some of the feedback and discussion would be uh, particularly helpful, although of course, uh, fair game for any and all of this. My uh, co-author Jenny Aker is actually here with us. Um, so thanks Jenny for also uh, joining. And this is a, a project on technology adoption. So let me go ahead and start by kind of motivating why we're interested in this particular technology. We're starting from this very broad motivation of the fact that if you look around the world over the last several decades, yields in agriculture have grown tremendously uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa is an exception to that rule. The part of Sub-Saharan Africa that we're studying, which is the Sahel, is a particular exception to that rule. Yields have largely been flat. And so what that means is any increase in overall food production that's happened over the last several decades has come from bringing new land into production, which means that farmers are being pushed onto kind of increasingly marginal lands, which makes them less resilient to shocks. Uh, and in particular, you can think of kind of a climate change motivation uh, in the background here. So what this really tees up is the need for technologies that can simultaneously help boost yields, but also restore degraded land to avoid uh, this kind of accelerating this process of, of land degradation and uh, at, at the extreme desertification in the region. One uh, promising technology, and the one that we're gonna be talking about today is uh, an example of, of a technology that's in this broader class of rainwater harvesting techniques. We're gonna be talking about something called a demi-loon. This is a picture of the demi-loon that you can see on the screen. And what this is, it's a, it's a fairly large kind of half moon shaped berm that farmers construct on the field. Importantly, they're constructing it on severely degraded land. So you can see actually this is land and I'll show you in the next slide as well. This is land where in the absence of demi-loons, really nothing would be growing. And so the idea is that these get constructed before the onset of the annual rains. When it rains, the rainfall gets captured in these berms. Any topsoil that would have run off with the rain is also getting captured. And then farmers are planting in the demi loons. And so you can see on the next figure uh, or the next photo that this is actually this little pocket of productivity on land that previously would have been completely uh, degraded. One of the nice things about this is it's a fairly low capital uh, kind of technology, technique technology um, that does require a fair amount of labor, but labor tends to be the thing that uh, pretty poor farmers uh, have. An important feature of the technology is that the labor investment is happening before the rains, which is also when farmers are planting. And so the labor investment is happening at the time of the year when there are not a lot of other competing needs for labor uh, in agriculture. The puzzle that we're gonna be trying to study here is given all these nice things that, uh, that I've just told you, including if you talk to the agronomist that this is a technology you know, that increases uh, yields and profits over time. When you look around, why is adoption so low? So in Niger, about 10% uh, or fewer of farmers are using any rainwater harvesting techniques. And one of the things that we explore in this paper, actually kind of the main motivation for the experimental design that I'm gonna to describe to you is that a lot of the costs, and as I said before, these are mostly labor costs are upfront while the benefits are longer term. So once farmers construct the demi loons over the next three years or so, they're getting some production off of this land that was previously unproductive, but that's a fairly long time horizon. So it could be a problem associated with the cash available at the time that the investments are happening, or it could be that just high discount rates because these are poor farmers mean that the kind of private profitability of the technology doesn't appear particularly high. Of course, information could also be a constraint and uh, that of course is what we find in this paper. Um, so what we do is a village level randomized control trial. The idea is that by targeting these different barriers to uh, technology adoption, we take as evidence that the barriers are important if we see adoption responding to those treatments, okay? So we have uh, four treatment arms that we compare to a control group and the control we're just doing surveys. All of the four treatment arms get training. And so this is a fairly standard 
training. We can talk more about it as we go, but it involves kind of a classroom component where they get technical information about the demi loons and why they work. And then a hands-on field component where farmers go to the field and actually practice constructing demi loons together. This training really targets any kind of informational barriers to technology adoption. But then we layer on top of it different kinds of cash transfers and the other treatment arms to try to target these different barriers, either at the adoption stage or the benefit stage. So we provide an unconditional cash transfer and one treatment arm designed to address any kind of cash on hand liquidity constraints that farmers have. So what this should do is if the technology is not privately profitable from the perspective of the farmer, they can take this unconditional transfer and spend it on whatever the highest value thing available to them. They need not construct demi loans for it. While this conditional cash transfer targets kind of high discount rates by increasing the short run returns to demi loan adoption, it's basically a piece rate or you know, for every demi loan you construct, you get a small transfer. There's a fourth arm that we're not going to spend really any time talking about in this very short presentation, which is really just meant to untangle the fact that unconditional cash transfers by design happen at the start of a desired behavior change, while conditional cash transfers happen at the end of a desired behavior change. There's a substantial literature comparing these two different approaches to generating behavior change. So we have this last arm, which is an unconditional cash transfer, but time to coincide with the conditional cash transfer to kind of separate any differences in timing versus modality. So that's what that's doing hanging around in the background. We do this intervention and then we follow adoption and other agricultural outcomes for three years. Um, the sample is 180 villages, which gives us about uh, 2,800 farmers. We're stratifying by gender. I'm not gonna talk much about the gender results, but if you guys wanna chat about that, that would be great. We do uh, household surveys at baseline after one year and then again after three years. And then we also do extensive measurement of adoption by sending enumerators to the field. One convenient thing about demi loons is they're quite easy to see. So the enumerators are actually just able to count them and that becomes our main um, adoption outcome. So it's not self-reported, it's observed by, um, by enumerators. We also measure spillovers at inline by sampling um, other farmers in treatment and control villages that were not targeted through the training or cash transfers. All right, so the headline results are on adoption. We see very striking results. So, uh, so you know, in some ways we can we can kind of stop at this slide, and this is a lot of the story. On the left, what you see is the probability of any demi loon adoption, and this is going from I think you can see my cursor. This is going from about four or five percent in the control group up to about ninety five percent in uh, training alone, and then we've kind of maxed out. So there's really no additional variation across the, the the treatment arms. This is a very large effect compared to basically anything you will see in the training literature or technology adoption literature. And so one of the things that we're really working on currently in the in the draft paper is how much we can say about exactly why it is that the training is so effective in this case. Now, if you look at the unconditional mean number of demi loans adopted, in the first year, we see a little bit of variation where these two cash transfers, the early unconditional cash transfer and the conditional cash transfer, do increase demi loan adoption a bit by about 25 to 40%. But this difference between the control group and training is relatively large. And in addition, if you look three years later, any of these treatment differences have really washed out. So there's a little bit of an additional bump of the cash transfers right away, but then over the kind of three year span, it all evens out. The training group catches up a little bit. And, and in particular, we see you know, a little bit of disadoption, but mostly it's just that you get a lot of catch up by, not a lot, but you get a bit of catch up by the farmers who, who are a bit slower to adopt. The other thing to notice actually is that the control group starts to catch up a little bit. So when we look at the longer run treatment effects, you wanna sort of keep that, um, keep that in mind. But the, the kind of conclusion that we draw from this pattern of results is really that most of the action appears to be from training alone, right? So we had this kind of careful design to look at different barriers to adoption associated with the timing of costs and benefits, but it turns out that those are really swamped by just the information treatment, just getting uh, training alone. Before I talk a little bit more about that, let me just show you a few other results that we have just to give you a sense of what is this technology doing to other aspects of, uh, of farmers' production decisions. 
So the first thing, just focusing on uh, the left column here, these are regression results, just cross-sectional regressions. It's a randomized trial, so it's pretty straightforward analysis, um, ordinarily squares. And this is a, a measure of the z-score of uh, the farmer's overall production. So because this is bringing new land that otherwise would be unproductive back under production. We don't want to look at yields. We want to look at total agricultural revenues. And what you see is there's about a 0.13 to 0.14 standard, standard deviation increase in overall agricultural revenues. That turns out to be equivalent to about 40 US dollars. It's a fairly substantial increase. And I'll show you in just a second kind of the private cost benefit from the farmer's perspective um, of this. The other thing that's worth uh, looking at is do, do these claims of this helps uh, restore degraded land actually turn out to be true? This is looking at end lines, so three years after the initial training. And what we see is that there's about a 30 percentage point increase in the likelihood that the farmer was able to bring previously uncultivated land back into production and a smaller but still important uh, decrease in the probability that they had to phase any land out of production. So it does appear that some of these claims of reducing this land degradation process um, are actually showing up here. We have a bunch of other outcomes in the paper, of course, but to come to this kind of, so what is the bottom line? There is a substantial expenditure increase on labor, uh, but it's really concentrated during the first year. So during that year when they're constructing the demi loans, um, they're both investing a lot of family labor, also hiring a fair amount of labor. But even in that first year when most of the costs are incurred, we calculate that on average it's privately profitable. This is a pretty back of the envelope exercise, but this increase of about 40 US dollars in agricultural revenue more than offsets this additional expenditure in labor. Um, and you could probably guess, but the training turns out to be uh, more cost effective than, than the treatment arms with cash transfers involved. Okay, so let me um, spend my last uh, maybe two or three minutes just setting up sort of how we're thinking about this last section of the paper, which you know, would be great to hear people's thoughts on, which is really trying to understand what was it about the training in this context that allowed it to be so effective. So as I mentioned already, the literature on training in economics, I should say at least, um, has found much more muted effects of training on technology adoption. And so this is really an outlier. And the experiment, as you saw, is really not designed to try to disentangle all of the details of what made the training particularly effective in this case. So we're doing some new analysis. This is not in the paper, but just to tee up some of the things that you could also ask about. Um, you know, we're trying to look at different uh, data and different results to try to see what additional progress we can make. So for one, we do have this spillover sample, which allows us to see how adoption spreads in the population, but then all, also how other types of information spread in the population to see if we can use those patterns to say something more. And then in addition, we did a small kind of light touch nudge intervention at, at the end line where we just gave people different kind of encouraging messages to see if any of them were particularly important. So let me show you what we're, what we're seeing on those. Um, first, looking at kind of informational channels, there's a lot going on on this slide. Let me try to summarize it quickly for you. The, the left two columns are looking at adoption. The right two columns are looking at information. This top panel is the spillover sample. So these are randomly selected farmers who are not part of the original training. And so how we think about those is farmers who are indirectly exposed. And what you can see from this is that there is some diffusion of adoption. There's an increase in kind of this extensive margin measure of did they adopt any demi loons. The number goes up by a fairly small amount. But if you compare that to the direct effects of training down in the bottom panel, this is relatively small. Right, so it doesn't appear that indirect training is a substitute for direct participation. So whatever that kind of social learning process that's going on, it has some effect, but it's not nearly as effective as just attending the training in the first place. If we look at uh, this column, is a little funny because you have to pay attention to the mean and the control group. One thing that I didn't mention at the beginning is this is not a totally new technology. People know about this technology. By the end line, three years in, everybody, even in the control group, is aware of the technology. And so awareness doesn't seem to be what's going on through the training because awareness spreads, awareness is already high. Instead, if we look over at this last column, this is a test score of kind of technical information that farmers have. In the directly trained sample, in our main sample, 
we see a substantial increase in kind of technical specific details of how do you construct the technology, that doesn't diffuse. So the, the farmers who are not direct participants in the training, while they know about the technology, they're experimenting with it a little bit, they don't have these precise technical details of what are the dimensions of it, how do you go about constructing it, et cetera. So we think that this may be important. It may be that actually participating in the training is really important for getting this kind of specific technical information that can't really diffuse through the population quite as well. So that's some suggestive evidence. And then the other thing is these kind of non-informational channels. We can't do kind of an exhaustive study of this, but we do these different nudges and we see some suggestive results that um, reminding farmers that the ministry staff are going to be visiting the village. So the fact that there's this kind of out, this engagement by outside organizations seems to be helping to encourage farmers. And then in addition, making the costs and benefits more salient, kind of reminding them of it seems to also have a little bit of an additional effect on, uh, on kind of short run adoption. So we think this is suggestive that both non-informational and informational channels underlie some of the large treatment effects that we have from the training that have to be received directly uh, through participation as opposed to just secondary exposure to the technology itself, which could help explain some of the low levels of adoption in the rest of the population, whereas training delivers these things very effectively and kind of unlocks this additional adoption potential. Okay, so I will uh, wrap up just by saying, you know, we, we see this as some we think compelling evidence that, that trainings can be quite effective in increasing technology adoption, particularly for profitable technologies. Of course, that's the other important thing about this setting is a lot of the technologies that get pushed in development don't exactly uh, help farmers in all cases. We're doing some ongoing work, for example, to try to um, increase uh, tracking of this through remote sensing. We're scaling it up with the Ministry of Environment. So lots of other fun stuff going on. And I will wrap up there with some thank yous and turn it over to discussion. Great, thank you so much, Kelsey. That was uh, fascinating and a really fantastic summary of just a lot of work and a lot of results in this paper. So well, well done fitting it into about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so we have a, a queue that's begun first, uh, Maria and then Sally. Um, Maria, do you want me to read yours or do you wanna just, do you wanna ask it yourself? Is your internet good enough? Um, yeah, sure. I can yeah, ask. Go for it. Right now. Go for it. <laughs> uh, so first of all, thank you for the really interesting talk. Like, I loved it. <laughs> it was a lot of information, though. So I hope the questions that I'm asking now are not entirely stupid. Um, first of all, I would love to hear what you um, where you also mentioned about like the different gender effects um, that that on that's like one of the questions. Then I was wondering, I didn't like catch in the beginning the stu uh, the study design exactly. Yeah. Like, how did you randomize it? Yeah. Um, was that like over multiple regions or um, because I was like for a second I was there like ah oh, did there is there was there some clustering going on in some some sort like did you account for that if so how same thing multiple time spells did I catch that right at the end like you had that over multiple time time spells and you had like cases of staggered adoption did you take care of that when you were estimating it I mean because like the recent papers from I think I Goodman and Bacon and so on right in there. There is so much stuff in how you need to take care of staggered adoption in order to not, not completely, <laughs> um, well, uh, screw up with your estimators and so on. So yeah, sorry, that was like three questions now. No, that's great. That's great. That gives me uh, it gives me a good excuse to provide some more details on on some things. So um, let me actually, uh, I think, let me work backwards because I think the most substantive one was the first one that you brought up, and I think it um, it had a, a I see at least one follow up uh, question in the chat. So the first is on the on the um, on the timing question. So we actually get off the hook with uh, with the challenges, that, the empirical challenges that you're bringing up in two ways. One is just by doing a randomized control trial. So we have this balance between treatment and control. And so we're not worried about things like the timing of adoption or something like that being correlated with other latent information or latent characteristics. But the other thing is that importantly, what's different about our our design versus the kind of difference in difference analysis that you're referring to is the treatment happened at the same time for everyone. So I, I think I didn't fully explain that. What we do is we go in 
at the beginning of 2018 and everybody gets trained, everybody gets told about any kind of treatment that they're in, whether it's a cash transfers, training only, whatever. And then all that we're doing over time is visiting the same communities and conducting surveys and visiting their field. So it's just the outcome data that have time variation in them. The treatment has no time variation in it. And that's important because that lets us just do kind of straight OLS analysis and not worry uh, about this. In addition, one thing that we're doing, which I mean, we could do something fancier, but the simplest way to do this is we're just looking at cross sections. So we either look at uh, outcomes one year out or outcomes three years out. And so in that sense, we're just conducting cross-sectional OLS regression. So there's really nothing particularly interesting going on there. Um, the treatment is clustered though. So I'll, I'll say just a little bit more about the kind of sampling frame and how that's, uh, how that's set up. And so we do cluster standard errors at the village level because that's the level of, uh, of randomization. So the, um, the sampling frame is that we first go in prior to the baseline survey and do a complete listing of the village. And so that you know, is up to a, you know, 100 households uh, or more. And then we select 16 households to be part of the sample. Um, and then that 16 households uh, selection is actually stratified by gender. And I'll talk, I, I saw there was a question about sort of what does it mean to have treatment assignment by gender in this kind of a, a, a case. But uh, for now, just, bear with me. <laughs> so so we, we, uh, we sample, we balance, we do this kind of what's called a min-max T kind of a randomization, which means that we're simultaneously randomly drawing 16 households from the community and assigning that community to treatment, doing that many times, testing balance, and then choosing the draw with that minimizes the maximum T statistic across the different treatment assignments, okay? So we're, we're simultaneously getting this random selection off of kind of a census of eligible households, and we're getting the randomization across these, uh, across these five different treatment arms, which includes the control group. Now, one of the nice things that that kind of um, design lets us do is that sets up the spillover. I know you didn't ask about it, so this is just bonus information. Um, that sets up the spillover sample because we have this random selection of 16 households off of a complete listing at baseline. We can go back in at end line and select four more random households and still have this kind of sampling frame that preserves the balance between the new spillover guys and the ones that were initially selected to be part of the uh, of the main sample, right? So that's kind of a nice feature of this. Let's see. Um, I'm region, it's, it's, all, it's all broadly within one region. There are kind of two somewhat distinct study areas, and we do some work in the paper actually to talk a little bit about there. They are distinct sort of differences, uh, regional differences in terms of land size in terms of labor availability in terms of a number of different things. And we actually do see some substantial differences across them in terms of adoption. The challenging thing of course is interpretation. We have two, <laughs> two sort of distinct areas. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard to know exactly what it is that drives some of the differences. So for the most part, we just pool that together uh, in the analysis. And then I think we have a table in there with heterogeneous treatment effects that actually shows some of these, some of these regional differences. Um, okay, so that's like the, the design background. Um, and I hope that answered the question on, so it's village level assignment with a random sample. It's like it, the, the whole village doesn't get treated. If, if the village is treated, it just means that if you are selected for treatment within the village, then you're treated, right? Um, the gender question, um, so what we see is that in year one, women are, and I'll, let me actually first answer the question that hasn't been spoken out loud because I think it'll help everybody follow this, this answer about the results. So what it means to treat the female household head versus the male household head is just who was invited for training and who received the cash transfers, okay? So, so of course it's, a household's you know, production decisions to some degree. But what we were interested in, in particular with the gender differentiation is, you know, one, there's been work suggesting that in other sort of development 
areas, targets that giving transfers to men versus women have substantially different effects. So we thought in this case, it also might be true that giving cash transfer conditional or unconditional could have different effects depending on who receives it. We were also really interested in, for example, the fact that this is a fairly labor intensive technology, whether women, for example, have less say over how labor is allocated, whether it's more difficult for them to affect some of the um, some of the inputs to adoption that, that would be necessary. What we end up seeing is there are kind of a few pieces to the gender results. So one is we track actually um, who attends the training and the training attendance is equally high for men and for women. But if it's a woman that's targeted for training, she ought more, much more often uh, brings along an additional family member. Right, so it appears that one of the strategies by which women were able to get uh, adoption to occur is potentially by turning it into more of a household decision. Whereas when it was the man who was invited to the training, it was more likely that he was the sole household representative that showed up for the training. Um, what we see though, is that in the short run, adoption outcomes are slightly lower, but only like five demi loons less for uh, in households where the woman was targeted by year three, these differences have, have sort of evened out. And so what appears to be the case is that gender is not, I mean, the broad conclusion, gender is not you know, a big barrier to adoption of this type of technology. And one of the things that, that we think this is consistent with is the finding that, um, that financial constraints are not a large barrier to adoption. You know, So the fact that we don't see the cash transfers having a big additional effect on adoption outcomes, we think is consistent with the fact that gender is not playing a really binding role. If this were a technology where it was more capital intensive, you needed you know, cash up front, cash at the back end, et cetera, then it might be harder for women to leverage the family resources that they needed. But in this case, we think it, you know, that that may be sort of consistency between the treatment differences and what we're seeing in the gender domain. So I think hopefully that helps some of the uh, answer some of those questions, but happy to you know take more of them. Great. I think our next question comes from Sally and then Brian and then Jamie. Yes, Kelsey, thank you very much uh, for your enlightening presentation. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. So my question is more about Niger as your country study and its institutions. If these training programs are so effective, you know, for um, rainforest harvesting, and I'm assuming they're also cost efficient, not very costly to implement, why, you know, they haven't been so widespread to begin with? You know, you also talk about spillover effects in your study. So uh, why, you know, by that time you started your study, you were still able to exploit that variation, you know, because it sounds like these programs should have been widespread for decades, but I'm not familiar with the technology. I'm not familiar with the context. Yeah. Yeah. So this is my question to you as, as the uh, for expert. Thank you. Great. Thanks. It's, it is a great question. And, um, you know, I'll invite if, if Jenny wants to step in at all with this, but let me, let me first say a few things. So one, one thing that actually was really distinct about how, so we worked very closely with the ministry to design the training, the Ministry of Environment officials were the ones who were actually uh, implementing it, but we were pretty involved and Jenny in particular was very, very involved. She lived in Niger for 10 years. She's, you know, she's worked in, in agriculture there for a long time. And I think one of the things that turned out to be really important is other organizations had been promoting these technologies for, for quite some time. And so I think, you know, a different way of, of asking your question that's even more specific is, you know, given that organizations were doing trainings on these technologies, why, you know, how could we possibly be having additional effects? And so a couple of things. One is um, we we're very careful to design the training so that households didn't need any specialized equipment. They didn't need any kind of outside, you know, stuff. We, we explained it where you could pace off the dimensions of the demi loons. You could use sort of typical household farming implements. Basically, it was it was taking it from being kind of a new technology that required new implements and sort of new uh, know-how to something that people could 
do with the resources that they had available. And so I think that that is one important thing is that, you know, to the extent that the trainings previously were saying, oh, you need, you know, this A-frame compass thing where you can trace out exactly perfect half moons and on and on and on, that starts to feel like, well, as soon as I don't have that implement, not a technology for me. Whereas we tried to, to make sure that this was something that was kind of within reach for, you know, for basically anyone. Now, of course, we can't say for sure how important um, that kind of thing was, but, uh, but that appears to be one aspect. The other thing that, um, that we've noticed that was different about how it was approached this time around versus in, in, in previous work is that, or in previous efforts was that um, a lot of the efforts to promote the rainwater harvesting techniques had been focused on communal land and rehabilitating communal land as opposed to private land. And so while farmers knew about this technology, they didn't necessarily know that it was something that they could be implementing on their own degraded land. They sort of saw it as something that you, you know, go out and have work parties and go work together on somebody, you know, on the, on the communal degraded lands, as opposed to something that you could use your own family labor for to implement on, on your fields. Um, those are our thoughts, those are not study findings. And so, you know, so I, I do think in some ways you're, you're also repeating to us what we see as an open question at the end of this project, which is that we saw an extremely effective training. Um, given that, you know, why is everyone not doing extremely effective trainings? And I think, you know, it's really also the combination of this is a technology that can be implemented with what people have available to them. And it also, given our data, is a profitable technology. And you know, th those two things may be hard to find, right? That, that there are plenty of kind of not so great technologies that farmers might be able to, you know, to take up on their own. And then there are plenty of highly profitable technologies that are just too capital intensive. And so we, we you know, we may have just also been lucky in sort of finding this sweet spot of something that, uh, that there's actually high demand for if you can unlock uh, the knowledge for it. So, you know, as I mentioned at the very end, we are, we are working right now with the Ministry of Environment to scale this up. And I think one of the big questions is, does this kind of training scale, right? That will be kind of the big test. Uh, is it something that works when it's really hands-on and really carefully implemented, or is it something that actually can scale up? Thank you. All right, great. Uh, Brian, I think you're next. Yeah, <clears throat> this kind of follows on directly um, in terms of potentially scaling up and so on. And you talked about in the paper, you talk about regional differences and the title, you talk about the Sahel. Yeah. And so, and this is obviously one of the challenges with randomized control trials. You have a lovely view of a small area and it's a really yeah. nice study and really great paper. How, especially when you're talking to a broader audience, do you help them understand both the potential and the limitations, yeah. especially the government people who want a magic bullet and, oh, well, we'll just do it everywhere. And we yeah. know it's good, so we'll tell people they have to do it. And at the same time, you know, trying to help people understand, okay, where is this potentially relevant or what yeah. kind of things should they think about? Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're great questions and they're, they're well-timed too, because we're actually kind of in the midst of, of, um, of getting into this scale-up phase. And so let me, um, it's a little bit beyond what you all saw in the paper, but let me say a little bit about what, how we're trying to think about the scale-up phase, which is actually to be very intentional, Brian, about the questions that you're asking. And rather than just saying, okay, proof of concept, we're done, like, here you go, you know, scale it up, rather to actually work closely with the ministry to try to vary some of the things that we think are the most important features that will have to change with scale up and to do so in a way that helps learn about if it is true that some of those lead to lower effectiveness of the intervention to try to be able to pinpoint what it is, right? So, so one of the challenges with, with going from these kind of small case study proof of concept kind of RCTs to a scalable version is that many things change simultaneously. And so it becomes very difficult to know what exactly was it that, you know, led, went from 90 percentage point treatment effects to 30 percentage points, which, you know, I think, I think could, could well happen. And I will say even 30 percentage point <laughs> impacts on adoption would still be, would still be pretty good. But, um, but some of the things that we're, that we're thinking about is one, actually we're, 
we're adding another rainwater harvesting uh, technique. So something called Xi, which is basically pit planting. And what we're interested in in there is whether kind of similar types of training on a related but different technology can also be similarly effective, right? So that helps us kind of think about generalizing not in the kind of regional differences space, but in the technology space where we think that giving farmers access to almost a menu of different techniques could lead to more widespread applicability than just going in with sort of the one thing and saying demi loons are bust. And you know, if you don't want demi loons, then, then we got nothing for you. So, so that's step one. And so the design of the scale up will vary whether we're looking at Xi only, whether we're looking at demi loons only, or whether we're actually offering both. I mean, it could also be that by giving farmers the opportunity to think about both, it actually lowers the effectiveness of, of both of them simultaneously. They're just coming in with one and saying, this is what you do. So, so that's an open question. The second thing is um, I, I spent a little bit of time explaining how we did the sampling where it was 16 households per community. Scaling up, choosing you know, 16 random households per community is not a particularly good way to go about uh, scaling up a training program. So one of the things that we're actually gonna try to test with the ministry during this next phase is, is that actually important, right? So it could be that one of the things that was important about this training is if you were one of the lucky 16, you got to come to this special exclusive training and therefore you felt like it was something really valuable and you paid a lot of attention to it and you felt like really you know, beholden to go ahead and follow up on it and so on versus if everybody in the community is invited, you know, on the one hand, that's much more feasible for scaling, but to the extent that that is part of the mechanism through which this works, then just opening it up to the whole community could lead to less impactful um, kinds of training. So that's another thing that we're gonna be trying to, to test out. So what we're trying to do with this, with this scale up phase is as much as possible to think about what we did, what has to change to make it feasible to scale. And then rather than just saying, okay, go for it, to work together in the next kind of chapter of this to test out whether those things lower adoption to the point that it would still be cost effective to do it in this you know, slightly more constrained way which would be more expensive, but if it leads to you know, enough additional adoption, then potentially worth it. So you know, I think some of the regional differences and so on, I think that's more we just have to sort of track as the rollout you know, happens. How does, it, how does it vary across locations? And I don't know, Jenny, how your internet is. I think Jenny's in Niger right now, if, if you wanna add anything on the, on the regional differences. That sounds good. No, okay. I'm not in Niger yet. <laughs> okay, great. Not I was supposed to be, but... Uh... <laughs> Flight difficulties, so. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Great. Okay, I think Janie is next and then Kurt. Yeah, I have a couple questions and they're both, um, I mean, I don't see that they're related, but maybe there is a connection that you that you see. And one was, um, I wanted to make sure, were the cash transfers randomized to as far as which households got it? They were, okay. Um, I I thought I saw that in the paper and I wanted to make sure. Okay, so did, but that didn't have any impact then on the adoption, sorry. And I don't read data very well. No, 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 I can, yeah, I can say a little bit yeah. more. Did, did you I have like, a follow-up? I do. Picture? So I'd like to know about that because that's really fascinating to me. And then other than cash transfers, um, did you take surveys about or um, do interviews on like maybe internal motivations for adopting Demi Loons? Yeah, great. These are these are really great questions. Um, so the the first thing the the way the design worked is um, the the treatment arms were basically nested or bundled. So if you were in an arm that had an unconditional cash transfer, for example, you got both the training and the cash transfer. And so the it, the all of the randomization of the cash transfers was at the village level. So if you were part of the study sample and you were in a cash transfer village, then you got the training and the cash transfer. So it was randomized, but in a way that exactly paralleled uh, the other sort of treatment assignment um, variation. And in terms of how to, to, to look at the results, basically, if you look at the probability of adoption, going from the control group to training only had this massive jump to where we saw almost 100% of farmers adopting at least some demi -loons. 
And so in that sense, it's like perhaps unsurprising that then when you add on top of that additional cash transfers, you can't really get more action, right? That, that you're already very close to 100%, that adding cash on top of that, you can't get above 100%, so you're kind of, you're at a ceiling, right? In terms of the level of adoption, the number of Demi loans adopted, that's where we saw in the first year that getting either cash up front or getting some conditional cash did have a little bit of an additional effect. So it does seem like in the very short run that some of that can be helpful, but by year three, that has dissipated. And so to the extent that we're interested in this as a policy intervention, whether we're getting that one year earlier versus one year later, that little bit of additional adoption, you know, it's not, it, it's kind of important, but it's not, you know, so terribly important, at least in, in terms of how we're able to see the results at this point, such that, you know, we don't think that these cash transfers are sort of unlocking additional adoption that you couldn't get through training anyway over a three-year time horizon, right? Now, the question of why is, is a good question, and, um, and that's something that, you know, we, we talk a little bit about it in the paper, but interestingly, there's kind of a growing um, set of studies in development economics looking at agricultural outcomes and these kind of cash constraints that increasingly is starting to see that aside from really capital intensive kinds of investments, these kinds of cash constraints just don't seem to be first order. Um, that, you know, that other things may be more important. And so, you know, I think this is not wildly inconsistent with, with that literature. In this particular setting, it appears that households, you know, are involved in savings and borrowing and transfers and stuff like that. A lot of it informal, um, but, you know, there are financial flows. And I think one thing that is uh, particularly important here is, as I mentioned, the labor investment is really happening at the slack time of year in the agricultural labor market. So it's the time of year when farmers are not involved in a lot of uh, agriculturally labor, sorry, labor intensive agricultural activities, which may have made it a lot easier to have that surplus labor that could be, that could be invested, which, you know, which may be part of why it wasn't quite so necessary to have uh, the, the, the cash availability. Um, and then, and then in terms of your questions about sort of what else other than, uh, other than money is, is, is motivating here. And I think that's, you know, it, it's a great question. So we've done a combination, you know, we're, we're quantitative researchers. So our qualitative, we do, we do a lot of focus groups and stuff like that, but we end up just learning from it and not uh, trying to include it in the papers. Um, but certainly we've, really been interested in, in talking to farmers about, you know, why is it that you did this? And so we designed this, I went through it really quickly in the slides, but we designed this kind of nudge uh, set of interventions as a way to try to get some quantitative uh, handle on some of what we were hearing from the qualitative interactions. And so what we did there is as part of the end line survey, read out scripts, this was also randomized. So read out scripts to farmers trying to Kind of almost prime different, uh, I don't know, non <laughs> psychological, I don't know, psychological is maybe not quite the right word, but things like, you know, you know, don't forget when to do it. So trying to get it kind of top of mind for people, trying to, to remind them of some of the costs and benefits. So trying to think about, you know, what, what's, what's, what information is, is salient to people to try to, um, to um, remind them that the Ministry of Environment is interested in their adoption. So this idea of kind of outside encouragement, but really exactly trying to get at some of these, uh, you know, non-financial channels that we think may be important. You know, there's it's part of what a training is, is it's this bundle of things. It's motivation, it's outside encouragement. It's you get a group of people together and they all get to, you know, feel like they're doing something uh, together that way. So. Anyway, that, that's a long answer to say it, it's a little unsatisfying <laughs> our answer to, to what you're asking about. But I think I think what we're trying to conclude with this last section on kind of non-informational channels behind the training is exactly what you're bringing up. That there's other stuff, that there's other motivations that are really important here. Okay, I'm going to use my prerogative as, as moderator here to ask a quick question before yeah. I 
apologize, Kurt, but I know you also have another conversation with Kelsey. So um, really quickly, you mentioned, you've mentioned a few times, you mentioned the paper that like one of the really fascinating and useful uh, aspects of the way in which you timed this intervention is that the labor inputs are primarily during the slack period, right? Um, and that that allows for essentially like mobility of resources in a way that you wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah. So question there, because you do acknowledge in the paper that if you had, if, if families hadn't been investing either their familial labor or hiring out labor to build these demi loons, that they themselves would be being paid for their labor in other sectors or parts of the local economy. And so that suggests to me there's still lost revenue, right? And now you you suggest that the cost benefit analysis, right, is still in their favor, but they don't know that at the time, mm -hmm. right? And so why is it that? So first of all, how yeah. much do they perceive that they're losing, right, in terms of the fact that they are now allocating this major resource that they have control of their their own labor to this thing that they don't have a lot, they don't necessarily have a lot of faith in yeah. which then gets to these questions of like trust about the who's training, mm -hmm. but that's a different set of questions, right? But given that they don't necessarily have the accurate cost benefit analysis going in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's clear that they are, at, you know, like they're, you say slack, but we know that they're not just like sitting around, yeah. right? <laughs> so how are you thinking about that? What does that mean in terms of the actual internal decision-making process, risk aversion totally. right, of the mm -hmm. farmers themselves? Yeah. Yeah, recognizing that like this is still a resource they would be putting to use at this time, even if it's not as important on the margin as it is, for instance, later in the season. Yeah, yeah, no, those are those are great questions, and I think one way to to think about kind of the summary of it is we're doing ex post <laughs> cost benefit uh, from the farmer's perspective. They had to do to make an adoption decision, an ex ante assessment, right? Before they knew what the impacts of the technology would be, before they knew exactly what their family's labor situation would be, et cetera, et cetera. So a couple of, a couple of answers, um, you know, that are not gonna tie it all up with a bow, but, but that are how we're thinking about it. One is that there are off-farm earning opportunities during, um, during this kind of slack agricultural season, but, they are somewhat limited. So the two main things that people are doing is uh, seasonal migration. And that one's actually important. And we include some results in the paper on that. You know, one of the interesting things about that is that's a, you know, that's a somewhat lumpy decision, right? You either go or you don't go. What we think is going on, and we, we don't have perfect data to show this, we think that people may be delaying some of their seasonal migration decisions as opposed to foregoing them altogether. Um, but you know, but but we don't we don't sort of have perfect data there, and the other thing is you can be selling your labor off farm to other kinds of non agricultural activities. And the thing with that is that you know I've I've, I've worked on that in some in, in other settings as well, and uh, those kinds of labor transactions tend to also be quite uncertain, right? So you're you're often going for work that may or may not materialize, and uh, and and. So while there are some learn earnings opportunities, it's a bit unclear how profitable they are on average. Um, so the opportunity cost of labor is not zero, but it's also not nearly as high as it would be during almost any other time of the year. Um, so that's on the cost side. On the benefit side, one of the things about the experimental design that is useful for helping us think a little bit about risk and how important risk was in households' decisions is there are actually two things going on in the conditional cash transfer arm. One is it's bringing some of the benefits sort of closer in time, forward in time, but the other is it's really reducing risk, right? So if I'm adopting and the only benefits that I'm gonna get from adoption are through increased agricultural revenues, then there, there's all sorts of like stochastic you know, rainfall, the technology could be bad, my, you know, goats could go trample it, like a million different things could happen that would mean that I actually get very low returns and, and possibly negative returns on this. What the conditional cash transfer does is basically say, if you adopt it, we will give you a piece rate, <laughs> you know, per demi loon adoption, you're gonna get paid. And so that has this big risk reduction um, a, a channel. Um, so if we had seen, and, and we do in fact see in the short run that that's a treatment arm that on the intensive margin in terms of the number of demi loons in the short run does have some of the highest adoption levels. So it's not huge, 
you know, it's not, there, there's still very high adoption levels in the, in the training only arm. But this does suggest that, you know, people are forecasting that this is going to be profitable. And then if that risk is removed or if the benefits are brought forward in time, that gets a little additional piece. We can't say which it is. You know, we don't know if it's the sooner payment or the more certain payment, but some combination of those two things does seem to be unlocking a little bit of additional adoption. But those are, it's a, it's a, it's a great point and it is one of the giant challenges of technology adoption is you have to like do the ex ante thing in order to get the ex post uh, benefits. Great. Okay. It's Kurt's, uh, Kurt's turn. And then there's a couple of questions, particularly I think from John Eldon in the chat there. So why don't you, why don't we go with Kurt first? And then if you have a chance to, uh, can do those as well. Great. And then we'll wrap up. Thanks, Kelsey. I have a few questions, but, but maybe I'll just ask the small one since we're, we're sort of running out of time. Um, it, it's, you know, a lot, picking up on previous discussions, it seems like, you know, this whole issue of, or, or not the whole issue, to just, you know, so many people adopting it really raises this question of like, do people view this as a choice? And so I'm kind of wondering if like, yeah. it, you know, is the message coming from the ministry of the environment really perceived as a message? And is this something you can play with in, in subsequent rounds, like, you know, varying who the messenger is? And is that yeah. something that seems useful to do just working and, you know, working with, with farmers around conservation agriculture in Zambia, yeah. you know, you cannot get them to do this kind of thing no matter what. And so it seems shocking to see these super high rates. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. And uh, one of the kind of nudge channels that we tried to unlock is actually a slightly different one. And it's it's a slightly hard one to, to kind of write about, but we call it permission seeking. And so it's, it's almost the inverse of what you're describing. It's that it's that farmers are very responsive to the idea that, you know, in, in a somewhat conformist culture, they're being given permission to go out and do something different. Um, and so, so it's, it's, it's really the inverse of the mandate. It's more the, you can, you know, step outside of the mold and, and, and do something a bit different. And we did find some evidence that that, you know, that that could actually be important. Again, it's hard to know how to kind of quantitatively interpret those kind of, you know, light touch nudge things. Um, I think exploring who the messenger is, I think certainly, you know, could be a direction to go in. I guess my, my initial reaction, and I, Jenny, feel free to jump in here as well, but my initial reaction would be that if, if there were a really clear sense of this was a mandate, that we might have seen more spillovers than we did. That if, you know, if, the, if the spillover farmers felt like the ministry is gonna be coming to check up on our community, I better have done it too kind of thing, that that, that might have, but of course you can also, you know, justify it that, that if you were at the training, that's the, those are the people who've been ordered or, or, or something like that. So I think it's something that, that is something that we could explore um, a bit more. Jenny, I don't know if in the, in the focus groups that you were doing, if that came up at all, or did she, it looks like she dropped off actually. Um, so, so in any case, I, I think that, that uh, we saw a little, we, we heard farmers talking a little bit more about this kind of permission seeking type of story than uh, I was told to do it. And so I had to kind of a story um, but I think I think certainly that's something that that we could explore more going forward. Okay, we're getting really close to one o'clock here. There is yeah, and I'm happy to to stay on and chat if if people have more questions. But you know, but these have been these have been really really excellent questions and comments. So I really appreciate the the chance to hear from you all. Yeah, so then let's just um, let's just maybe uh, if, if folks that do want to, I know we've got still one or two more minutes, but I feel that we'll end up with a conversation that then has to be interrupted. Um, and so maybe instead we can just do a, a, if you have any final comments for the larger group and then can hang around and then we'll just uh, do a round of applause thanking you. So what, any final last comments? No, other than other than you know, these are great questions, and I share many of them. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I appreciate it, and I think that um, we're excited about kind of the the next steps with with this work. I think we see this as like the first kind of 
you know, flag in what's going to be a, a research agenda. And we're bringing on a soil scientist from Niger as a co-author for the scale up work with um, with the ministry. And so I think that'll also be you know really useful for getting some of the additional environmental outcomes to be you know a little bit more grounded in uh, in what's happening in agriculture on the ground, which will be fun. Great. Well, um, I, I'm sure everybody else agrees with me. That was a really fascinating conversation and discussion. And um, I'm really looking forward to like all, like hearing about the sort of scaling up and challenges associated with that and how that goes. <laughs> um, but thanks so much for joining us. Again, please hang around if uh, you want to continue the conversation. I was like, Kelsey will be here. I'll be here. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again on Wednesday at the research series um, and then next week as well. All right.